Now I would like to give the floor uh, to Dr. Judith Varga, Minister of State for EU Rela Relations at the Prime Minister's Office uh, of Hungary. Social and economic effects of migration. This is the title of her speech. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests. Tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim, let me speak on English because I see many uh, guest speakers in the room. Uh, so, uh, as Minister of State for European Relations, it is my uh, first uh, duty to speak to our uh, expert uh, communities and to foreign citizens. So, thank you very much for coming to the conference. I think after so many distinguished speakers and presentations, valuable presentations, I have uh, serious doubts whether I can still offer you some novelty in this very hot topic of uh, migration. And uh, since there is so much to tell about this topic uh, that I just simply cannot limit it to 15 minutes, uh, I do hope that at least I can give you a hint of my take on migration in this short presentation. It is common sense that migration is the number one topic on the European Union agenda. And according to the recent Eurobarometer polls and data, migration and the security challenge which is linked to migration is the primary concern of European citizens. So it would be hard to deny this fact. Yesterday I was just talking to a Belgian uh, diplomat in the European Council uh, and he himself mentioned this without any question that of course there's no question that uh, European elections will be determined by this very, very hot topic. And uh, I do believe that uh, our answer and the citizens' answer to this question, how we should deal with migration in Europe, will actually reshape the political landscape in Europe according to those positions which parties may take on the migration issue. Ladies and gentlemen, as I spent my whole week in Brussels, I had the opportunity to remember my good old days because I had been living there for almost 10 years. And I take the, my favorite daily, Le Soir, which made me always upset and uh, uh, gave me a good uh, blood pressure instead of a cafe. So I just uh, had some time in the, in the hotel at my breakfast and I take the, the daily. And uh, it took me only a couple of minutes to bump into the first article combating populism in, in Europe, of course, in a migration and in an Eastern and Central European context. And uh, the author, uh, who was a professor from the ULB, actually argued uh, with the following sentences when he argued in order to, to fight the populist statements on migration. This is a translation by myself from French. We do need foreign labor force also. Living together is possible and that the diversity is richness. Well, so despite uh, so much criticism, because of course uh, everybody can read uh, between the lines that it was, uh, these sentences are targeted, uh, those politicians who are brave enough to face the mainstream and uh, brave enough to speak out of the box on migration. I always say when I'm, I'm having uh, negotiations uh, in Europe that despite so much criticism, it is, it is clear, Let be, let's be clear. In the framework of the European treaties, member states shall be free to have different opinions about how to face this historic challenge of migration. And although it is not the mainstream, it is still a legitimate position. And it is a legitimate position not to agree that migration should be a solution to our demographic and labor market problems, and nor that migration would be beneficial for European development or prosperity. And when I read the sentence that living together is possible, all what came to my mind was also the memory of my, my 10 years uh, experience in Brussels and the moment when we exactly 10 years ago decided with my husband to to take the adventure to work for the European Union and our friends who already lived there uh, advised us uh, in first place, please buy a map about Brussels and circle those areas in the city where you should avoid to rent an apartment. So uh, parallel society for me was, was a personal experience and uh, even Belgian citizens told me if you want to see the third world, you don't have to go too far uh, you have to only cross the channel 
uh, near Molenbeek or any other parts. And uh, I do appreciate and respect uh, Belgian citizens, so it is not a take on them. And I have a lot of friends, but uh, already after many years of friendship, we can, we can be honest, at least on a citizen's level, to each other. So in our views and in the spirit of the good European dialogue and uh, the respect for the motto united in diversity, it is, in my opinion, only a question of tolerance and patience in migration to accept both opinions or diverse opinions because uh, this is a matter of national competence and national identity, national history, cultural background. So we have all right to have a different opinion and therefore, as Prime Minister Orban already said back June in his Europe speech, that it is not a compromise what we need here, but it's rather a mutual respect. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, as a Minister of State for European Relations, my primary task is to travel around Europe, explain Hungary, explain the Hungarian position, mostly in connection with Article 7 procedures, since this uh, nice dossier landed on my desk in the summer. And it is still uh, doesn't want to uh, end. It uh, looks to be a, or seems to be a, an unended, never-ending story. So this year, so far, I met dozens of politicians, NGO representatives, think tanks, experts from over 10 countries in Europe. And uh, there has been a constant recurring question or a whispering topic in the corridor. Why do Europe's leading politicians want to settle migrants on the continent? Why do they want mass colonization to Europe? And uh, in the spirit of mutual understanding, mutual respect, I try to somehow group all the views what I already heard during my uh, negotiations and, and meetings all across Europe. And I try to uh, organize them into four uh, categories. And in the following, I will try to to argue that these theories are all wrong. Uh, since um, State Secretary Katani Novak already uh, had a very detailed explanation on the demographic, demographic lines and challenges, I won't touch uh, it up on so uh, longly, but uh, let me list these four categories. They often say that we need migration in order to tackle the labor shortage. This is always the most popular answer. The second one, which is closely linked to this, Aging society is a challenge. We are facing a demographic collapse, so we need fresh uh, mass migration so we, uh, we can avoid this catastrophe to come. And uh, there is a third one, which is my personal uh, opinion, so, and it might sound as a conspiracy theory, but since we are here in a conference and we are talking among us, you may allow me to, to talk about some kind of political capital gaining and, and political succession when we are talking about uh, welcoming and embracing migration. And the fourth point is my favorite because this is what I have to face almost every week, the pressure from the mass liberal media in Western European countries. It sounds as banal as true it is. So let's have a close look at the first group, the tackling the labor shortage. Many claim that Europe's dynamic decline in global economic competition, the loss of space against world powers requires millions of new workers to boost the economy in Europe. But they forget that, that while pushing for migration, they just forget there is a drastic rate of youth unemployment in some countries, especially in those countries which are most exposed to mass migration. The unemployment of young people is a huge problem throughout Europe. And Europe was not able to tackle it efficiently. And according to the latest data, ladies and gentlemen, in January 2019, youth unemployment was nearly 40% in Greece. It was more than 30% in Italy, and the same data you can find in Spain. So these young Europeans who are most probably committed to the European core values, they should only be given tangible knowledge, good opportunities for mobilization, and they could easily fill in the well-paid jobs where they are needed. And this would not only alleviate the unemployment challenge, but they could also provide a vision for these young people to establish the family project or to have a family. Because nowadays, in the time of individualism and selfishness, you have to be brave enough to enter this adventure. But uh, let me also just point to, a, to an interesting uh, 
factor, the social behavior of citizens is also changing. For more than a decade, social sociologists have described the so-called free time paradigm, the phenomenon of how the role of work and leisure changes fundamentally on our lives. So with the changing character of our work, we can even do our job from our weekend house or sitting at the Danube bench and sending emails from our laptops. It will all result in requiring less and less uh, low-skilled uh, workforce in Europe. And also the <clears throat> technological development, the labor market will be radically transformed. Uh, just look at uh, the robotics, look at g digitization. So this all will require the work of high value added professionals, which will lead to lower need for current low skill jobs again. So this can lead to further increase in migrant unemployment and which will deepen social tensions. A vicious circle starts and we do not know where it ends. And integration to the labor market will only succeed among those migrants who can adapt easily to the technological development However, the masses still remain and become even more isolated. So statistics show that the employment of migrants is much lower than that of the domestic population. In Germany, for example, this ratio was 25% in 2018, and one third of them worked only periodically. So not full time, not all, all the year. So integration is hardly feasible, not only because of people coming from different cultural backgrounds, but also by the weakened Western European identities. Do we know who we are? Because in Europe, I, I had always the impression when I was talking to my fellows, they were um, assistants in the European Parliament or co-workers of the European Commission or young and free, uh, um, happy living uh, European uh, youth in Brussels, because Brussels is a very nice hub to live in. Let's, let's be honest, actually. You can have it all. And uh, what I saw that uh, when I told them, aren't you fear of uh, running into a situation where you no longer feel yourself European or there won't be any Christianity in Europe? And when I looked back, there were nobody behind me when I was running with my flag uh, with, the, with Christianism. Especially this uh, moment was very, very uh, remarkable exactly three years ago when the terrorist attack actually hit Brussels. And the reaction of the society of the Western European society for me was actually just unacceptable. I, I wanted to stop the world. I wanted to say that this is now a Caesar in history and we don't move unless we tackle this issue. And uh, the general reaction, not only from my uh, colleagues, uh, Western European colleagues, but also at school on the streets was the full denial or the opposite, let's, let's be more uh, concerned about the rights of those migrants who are now maybe subject to more attacks. So for me, that was a twisted situation in, in history. And uh, I think that is also a problem when we are talking about the chances of integration that those who are arriving, they don't really know in which cultural uh, frame they should integrate themselves into. So if there is any identity in Europe at all, and unsuccessful integration creates more internal tensions. Even if we distribute the problem, like uh, the very nice idea of having quotas, compulsory quotas in Europe, it will not cease to exist. The problem will be there. And indeed, it will create additional conflicts, and not only within member states, but also among member states. And that's how we are now. Because uh, the whole story of Article 7 procedure, the only outcome of this is uh, so far that it works against the cohesion between member states. It raises a lot of mistrust. Uh, you, should, you should experience the atmosphere in the council and in the, in the meeting of the ambassadors. It is spoiled. It is not the Europe what we wanted to join or we joined. So we should stop this and we should start to uh, be faithful to the European motto and to respect diverse opinion. And uh, let me just give you a final remark to this first group. So when we are talking about the, the labor market shortage and the integration problem, in Western Europe, the concept of nations sounds already suspiciously, negatively. So that's why if I'm talking about our future, uh, our concept about the future of Europe, and we, we believe in the strong cooperation of strong nations, which may add 
to a strong Europe. I always replace the word strong nations with strong member states because they just don't want to understand what I'm talking about. They always think I'm a nationalist, but I'm not. So this is, this is very, very important to, to understand that uh, the concept of nation is actually is the essence of, of a phenomenon when I, I feel myself identi identical with, with certain community in Europe and because of my historical and cultural background. And due to historical facts, unfortunately, the concept of nation is more likely a source of, of nationalism for some Western European fellows. And uh, they don't uh, make their uh, research into Central European history because for us, the nation was a prerequisite for survival, always in history. Thank you. And, and of course, the second uh, step when we are talking about uh, the concept of the nation and the concept of strong Europe, of strong nations, if there's no nation at all or no feeling of community, or this is a very weak feeling, integration is determined to fail. A multicultural society does not create diversity, despite the fact that it is frequently said by leftist liberal opinion leaders. Rather, it leads to isolation and the emergence of parallel societies. So let me move to the second uh, group. This is the aging societies, the decreasing population, the demographic collapse issue. Of course, they see in this context uh, who uh, are pro-migration politicians that this is a possibility a good opportunity for us to tackle this challenge. And the, these arguments are wrapped in a nice sugar coat of solidarity, uh, but I think it's, it's self-deception and selfishness. Because what I often uh, see uh, in politicians' uh, speeches that uh, they only want to have the best part of migrants and uh, they don't and they can have the rest uh, left behind in their origin countries. I see I have to finish. Uh, let me just uh, mention three points. The political capital issue. In the family of the left wing and liberal parties, there is a problem uh, that they have no message. To every question, the answer is more Europe, more integration, deeper integration. And uh, they think that uh, by embracing migrants, they will be provided with a lot of political support. But they just, they should know that uh, these people, they won't give up on their own values, their own culture. And when uh, the crowd will just rise, they will opt for, an, for a political party which will represent their own values and their own cultural backgrounds. So this is uh, wrong to, to believe that with this they will have uh, some kind of political succession. And pressure from the mass media, I think, uh, in short, politics has been prohibited in Europe. So I do hope that in the future politicians will be free uh, in Western Europe as well, so there will be a real freedom of speech, that they can speak what they think about and they can name facts as they are. And no me ansha ansha. So they should be deliberated and I ask you to, to encourage them to be deliberated. And uh, all in all, yeah, last year I, I was very uh, adventurous and I went to a film uh, festival about migration and uh, it was Mikhail Haneke's film, the title is Happy End. We watched the same movie, I was sitting in a room with many fellows from Western Europe and at the end of the film we interpreted the drama. For me it was about a Europe that is old, rich and selfish and that has already given up on itself. However, for others, it was just about a strong message that we need to welcome more migration and these selfish Europeans, they don't want to help migrants. So I think we need respect. Although we are watching the same movie, we must, we must have the right to have a different interpretation of what we see. Thank you very much.